Okay, we are all right. On. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a nice sunny day today, and, and uh, tomorrow we're going to have snow. So how's that? Love Ohio. I don't believe we have anyone signed in for public comments. Is that correct? No public comments. All right, then we'll move on. The next item in the agenda is board president comments. Uh, I don't have any comments. Um, I had hoped just to say that I had hoped to attend the meeting in person uh, today, but that didn't work out. So hopefully uh, soon we'll all be together in person. All right, let's move on to staff reports. Mary Ellen. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, Chris is just gonna pull up the screen. Do you want the PowerPoint? Yes. Mm. All right, I have to move. So they should see it, but now I think that we all can see it. Uh, Steve, you guys are seeing the PowerPoint, correct? Yes. Actually, I'm seeing, I'm not seeing, there it is. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to get them both onto that screen and I can't seem to do that. So bear with me one second. Okay. So I'm sharing it on my first screen. Let's do it this way. Okay. Are you guys still seeing the PowerPoint? No. I'm not. Are you? No, I'm Anybody not. Else? No. There. Does everybody see it now? Yes. Yes. We can see it here. Okay. So I wanted to give you an update tonight on where we are with our reopening plans. This is the, the phased plan um, that we used last summer when we when we started reopening again. And we've been operating in that phase three for about six or seven months now. But we are making some headway into phase four at this point. You can put the next slide. And just this week, we made some changes to our COVID protocols. So um, we've uh, made some rollbacks. Um, they've all been made in a very, very safe, cautious way. But um, just on Monday, we took away the browsing bins. We have had customers put all of their materials back into a bin for um, quarantine after browsing. We've removed that. Um, we've restarted our newspaper subscription so people can read newspapers in our buildings. We have been quarantining our materials for 96 hours. So our meeting rooms were full of tubs of returned materials, but that was based on what we knew last year that we didn't know a lot about how COVID lived on the surface, but we've learned that's not the, the prevalent way that people um, catch COVID. So we have rolled that back to 48 hours as of yesterday. So that should free up a lot of space in our meeting rooms and get the material back on the shelves faster. And we hope to bring that to zero at some point in the near future. We also had extended our hold pickup times for people to have 10 days, but more and more people seem to be out and about. So we've dropped that down to seven days. And we had um, limits on how long people can be in the building. That had previously been for a one hour time limit to browse or to use a computer but we've been finding people need more time on the computers. So we've extended that to two hours now. Um, we've also started accepting cash payments again for services and fees. And um, we're allowing our staff now to per participate in outdoor promotional events, as long as they meet our safety criteria. So these would be things like outreach events, um, you know, participating in an outdoor farmer's market or festival, that kind of thing. And then we have been keeping all of our doors open just so there are less hands on the doors and more airflow, but now we're gonna close all of the doors again. And for the past six or seven months, all of our staff have been entering the building at the back entrance, but we're no longer gonna do that. We've reopened the front entrance for staff and that's closer to where staff park. So 
Um, gradually, we're, we're getting back to a new way of operating. And these are just the first changes that we've implemented this week. So um, more changes will be coming as we look to see what we can do safely and where things feel under the state. But these are all changes that were put into place yesterday. Um, does anybody have any questions about the protocols and the changes? Okay, here and then. Um, I have some really big, exciting news to share that we just um, learned yesterday. Uh, we, we had applied for a grant with the Sisters of Charity to help kids in Canton with learning loss. And um, the name of the project is Combating Learning Loss in Canton City. And I just got news last night that we received the grant. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is going to be a really exciting project for us to, to really make an impact on the children in Canton City. We've been awarded an $89,000 grant and it's to address learning loss. Typically summer is a time when there is learning loss, but everything has been so compounded by the um, pandemic. Kids have not been in school, kids have been remote. Everyone is at a different place. So what we're doing is we're gonna be providing weekly learning activity kits with reading and math based hands-on activities tied to their curriculum for Canton City children who are entering grades kindergarten through three. And we'll be distributing the kits um, between June 7th and August 7th. So the kids should receive about eight or nine uh, different activity kits. And um, to do this service, we're going to be utilizing our mobile services department. We have food and family stops where we'll be providing meals from the Children's Hunger Alliance. At those steps, we'll also have the kids available for families. Um, there are gonna be community partner stops where we'll also be going to. And then Canton City has a number of partner sites throughout the city where they're going to be doing summer enrichment um, programs. Um, these are the partners that we've identified that we're gonna work with so far. Canton City Schools, the YWCA, uh, CNA, Our Lady of Peace, St. Anthony, and we're continuing to reach out to other organizations to see how, um, how we might all continue to work together on this project. So we have a lot of work to do in the next month or so to get everything ready. There's a lot of assembly of the kits, but um, our team is really excited to be doing this work. Um, Mariana DiGiacomo, our community services director, she's worked very hard on this project to, to put it all together. And um, at some point later in the summer, after we kick things off, I'd like to have her come back and share with you guys about the project. But um, we're very grateful to have had this opportunity to do this. And, and uh, I, I think uh, it's it's really in our wheelhouse for how we can um, serve the children in Kansas City. Have they determined how they're going to uh, decide which children can participate? So we had estimate numbers from Canton City Schools that how many kids there are in that age group. So we based it off of those estimates of who will be participating in their summer programs. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. that would be big. Yes, yes. Okay, um, that concludes my report unless anyone has any questions about the project. Any other questions or comments for Mary Ellen? Congratulations on the grant, Mary Ellen. Oh, thank you, Joe. I knew you would be interested in this. <laughs> um, That's very exciting. That's good. Yeah, I love the fact that Canton City um, kids are included in this. Uh, I think it's going to make a huge difference. The only other thing I would add to the grant is um, probably next month we'll be coming to the board with a resolution. Uh, that money wasn't part of our budget, so we'll have to make a budget adjustment to allow us to spend it. Um, I'm assuming that'll be in May. Um, it could potentially be in June, but that'll be coming at some point soon. Okay. Well, that certainly is great, great news. Um, and I, when Mary Ellen and I last spoke, she, she was uh, eagerly awaiting um, the decision. So it's great that we got that. It's great that we can be impactful uh, with these kids because they certainly need all the help they can get. Um, will there be a, a, um, a breakdown of what the um, budget will be used for, Mary Ellen, the 89000 exactly? Yes, um, we, we can provide that. Um, 
I, I will share though, almost all of it is going towards the, the purchase of the items that are going in the kits. We are giving the, the staff time in kind for the preparation of the kits and the and the delivery of the kits. And there might be a small amount of money for marketing, but I, I think primarily all of it is for the kits contents. And I, I'll bring some examples That's of fun. kits for you guys to see next month. Yeah. And we'll we'll give you the full breakdown next month. Uh, I'm meeting with Mariana, I think, next week to okay. figure out how we're gonna budget it all. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, we have uh, Joe Schofield, the DHOP branch manager. Welcome, Joe. Hi, thank you so much. It is so wonderful to finally see and meet everyone in the room. I'm ecstatic to be here. Um, so as you said, my name is Joe Schofield. I'm the branch manager of the DHOP branch, um, which we affectionately call ourselves um, a small but mighty community library. <laughs> So that's the name we've kind of given ourselves. We are one of the smaller locations, but we are definitely a mighty branch. We are really embedded in the DeHoff community. We thankfully look like this little storybook house um, that is really on, in the middle of a neighborhood. We're right across from Hartford Middle School. And I invite you to come visit if you've never actually come to see DeHoff. It really is like a storybook. I'm gonna go ahead to the next slide. So today I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the work that we do at DeHoff. Um, so to start with, I wanted to kind of give you some numbers. So as you guys may remember, DHOP was the first location to reopen. Um, we really piloted the reopening sequence. And since July, when we opened, we opened the first week of July, we've had over 17,000 visits, circulated over 17,000 items. We've had 441 one-on-one um, -on -one services, which include help with devices, notary services, um, tutoring. We've been tutoring local Canton City students um, and, and really just helping people have that more embedded librarianship type services. We've also had almost 4,000 computer uses since we reopened, and we've had a Wi-Fi usage of 4,652. Oftentimes you can come by after hours and you will find DeHoff community patrons sitting outside on our front porch accessing Wi-Fi, sitting outside in, the, in their cars accessing it from the parking lot. And so that's been a huge service for us. In addition, the wonderful um, grace that you guys have given us with the $3 printing has been immensely important in my community. It's allowed patrons not only to print off their social services documents that they have to use for unemployment or other services, but also just yesterday, I had a mom in the library who was printing off documents or kind of uh, worksheets to help her students who were currently doing virtual learning. And so having that grace has really empowered my community to be able to support not only themselves, but their children on a day-to-day -day basis. You can go ahead and go next. So we also partner with our communities. We've really brought out some rich partnerships in this last year, even despite the precautions and the, the challenges of COVID. So as you see on the left, there's a picture of our grab and go meals for kids kits. We distribute those five days a week from the branch. It allows us to not only meet the, the hunger insecurity that is already um, that, we, that we know exists in the community, but it also lets us almost be a stopgap where kids were not in school, they were not getting necessarily the meals that they would regularly get while in the classroom, we can distribute it at DHOF. And so far this year, since we've been doing this, we've distributed 961 meals to youth ages two to 18. That was as of five o'clock yesterday. Um, my staff were still doing it, actually they just finished up service. And so that number is even higher today. And I will tell you that I, that I just learned earlier today that we're gonna be able to continue this partnership through the summer. So we'll be able to continue to get food in the hands of kids. And my favorite part about this program is that there is no income eligibility for it. So it really is us just getting food to hungry kids. And so they don't have to bring documentation. It can be a child walks up and gets it for themselves, a, a parent or guardian, um, or even someone who just has kids in their life that need that food, they, they can get it. So it's really a no questions asked type program, which is wonderful. This year, we've also started a, a really fruitful relationship with the Multi-County Juvenile Attention Center. Um, we have not only been doing virtual programming with the young men that are there and the, and the, the boys that are in the center, but we've also been sending them book kits every two weeks. So that way they get access to materials they wouldn't normally get to read. And we, um, I, there's actually myself and another librarian who curates those boxes. 
And then we also do a book club with these, uh, these young boys as well. So it's been a really fruitful relationship that we're excited to continue. Ever since I, I got to DHOF almost two years ago, we've had a great relationship with Lighthouse Ministries, which is literally 30 second walk up the, uh, up the sidewalk. We've done programming with them in the past. And I'm happy to report that we've now extended that partnership to a program that they're bringing um, starting in the fall with Bethel University. It's allowing local kids you know, in Stark County that have graduated recently. So they're really targeting 18 to 22 year olds who may not have had the option to go to college before. It's a low cost college opportunity and we're supporting them in almost being their, their local library when they don't have an academic library nearby. So we're looking at doing a deposit collection with them and some virtual programming as well, things like research skills. And we're able to highlight the work that we already offer um, our community and we're able to help meet that kind of niche need. So it's a great partnership. We also continue to partner with Canton City Schools. My children's librarian is currently doing um, virtual programming for them. And at least once or twice a week, she's actually zooming into classrooms and she's doing story times and lessons and really extending the collection and marketing what they can access even though they don't have access to their physical school libraries. And then we continue to partner, partner with the Martin Center. In the past, we've done book clubs with them and after school activities, and we're continuing to find new ways to partner with the Martin Center. At DHOF, we're also known for celebrating our community. And as you can see from the pictures, we're always looking at ways to celebrate the great unique people that exist at DHOF. In the bottom right-hand corner is one of my patrons who we know adores anime. He will read any anime or manga you can possibly get into his hands. And I was able to reach out to our collection development team and tell them about this unique patron. And when they get you know, little giveaways from the publishers, they actually send it to DHOF so we can give it to this patron. And I will tell you, he comes in every single day, no matter what, to access materials. We also do a lot with um, getting people's first library cards. And so it doesn't matter if they're a young child, as you see in the bottom left, or if they're a senior citizen. My team are great about going out and talking about the great things that you can find in the library. We also have quite a few patrons that, that regularly visit us who are just coming out of, um, kind of the prison system and they're looking at ways to become connected to their community again. And so not only can we offer them computer access and resources, but we can get them connected with their first library card, which they didn't even think they could have. And so that's a really powerful moment. And in the top left, you can see that our Friends of the Library group is continuing to be supportive of us in any way they can by helping us to package um, advanced reader copies to give to patrons and really just celebrate getting books in the hands of all readers. At DHOF, we're also known for advocating for our community and empowering their voices. When this fall, when it was time for voter registration, we all happily went out and contributed to artwork, to kind of uh, chalk art right in front of the branch to encourage people to get out and vote. People that didn't even realize that you could register to vote at the library. We also continue to advocate for our community in terms of connecting them with resources. So from the very beginning, when we first reopened to the public, communications was amazing at creating a huge flyer for us to um, advertise the different community connection pieces and paperwork that we have. And so you can come to the library not only to get your tax forms, to register to vote, but also to find mental health resources, which we know is so valued um, all, all times of year, but particularly during COVID. When I'm speaking about this presentation and what I really wanted to show you about DHOF, um, I'll be honest, this is, my, this is my, my third library system that I've worked for in my career. And my favorite part about my staff is that they are constantly looking back to, looking to give back to our community. On the left-hand side, um, you can see a, a whole bunch of crocheted and knitted items that we gathered for our, um, the local pregnancy center. When we shut down for COVID, the, the call that I got the most was from our knitting group and our crocheting group asking, when can we safely come back in the library? When, when can we have that, that togetherness? And when can we work together to give back? And that was a great opportunity for them to, to come together in the community to give back. 
one of the highlights of, of the year for, for Team Dehoff is our holiday celebration that happens every, every December. It's a great partnership between the library, local organizations, actually some of the neighborhood organizations come together to donate items to give to young children. Um, and our friends group. And, and this past December, of course, we, we couldn't have that. And it was it was hard. It was hard for the community. It was hard for my staff to know that we couldn't safely do that. So we actually came together as a staff group, not as you know a, a mandated thing from the library, but just a group of individuals who care about each other and care about the community to, to donate to two children. We adopted two children from Job and Family Services um, in order to support their holidays. And that's the way that that DHOF does. We're, we're a family and we look to give back to our community however we can. And not only do we do the work at the local level for the DHOF community, but we also strive for high professional achievements so that way we can give back to the library community at large, both at a state and national level. On this slide, you see a number of, of really prestigious things that my team has done within the last six months. So we've had staff who have um, been on the job on Newberry Medal Award Committee last year and celebrated <laughs> the, the winner um, of the Newberry Medal. One of my staff is also the chair of the James Cook Book Award Committee, which is a Ohio Library Council Book Award. We have a, a, the same staff member who was on the Newberry is also on the Notable Book Council this year for the American Library Association. In the past six months, we've had three of my staff who have become certified Ohio public libraries, club, sorry, public notaries, taking it to a total of four within my branch. I have six staff members and four of them are certified public notaries, which is really outstanding. I also have a staff member who is a Google certified educator level one certification that she just passed. And two of my staff collaborated on an upcoming article that was just accepted to public libraries which is the Journal for the Public Library Association. So in conclusion, DHOF is so much more than a library. We're really an institution in the community and we are there for our community. We partner, we celebrate, we give back, we advocate, we serve. And on the left-hand side, you can see all of the people who are involved. It's librarians, it's specialists, it's clerks, it's everyone in my building. But we couldn't do all of this great work for the community without all of the people that exist to support us, which you can see on the right-hand side. Everyone from the, the board, what you guys do to help support us, communications, administration and human resources, facilities and security, the business office, public services, community services, collection development and technical services and information technology. So we all work together so that we can be there for the DHOF community. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Wow, Joe, uh, this is Steve Pittman. Hey, that was just phenomenal. I think you ought to not change your name from mighty to very, very mighty. That's just just tremendously remarkable and just awesome and well done. Very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. I concur. And I just want to say thank you so much for being, being there for that for that community over there. I know it's greatly appreciated as much as it's needed. Um, so what you do in that community is very much appreciated and um, continue to do what you're doing. Thank you, absolutely. Good job. Thank you. Wow. When you have time to sleep, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have three kids, so I don't sleep. Okay. <laughs> Oh. I just feel like this is one of those drop the mic moments where I just want to drop the mic and say, okay, we're done, <laughs> you know. Well, please come out to DHOP so you can see it in action, because I, I can tell you all day long the great work that my team does. But until you walk in that building and you're greeted by Dewana, you have no idea what you're missing. So please come out anytime. I will we definitely will do plan that. to do that. Yes. Well, thank you again, Joe. Um, Moving, moving on in our agenda, the next item is the consent calendar. And uh, if you've had an opportunity to review the items contained within the consent calendar, I would ask for a motion to approve. So move. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Uh, aye. No opposed. Thank you. Uh, buildings and grounds committee. Um, I do have a report from Derek. 
Um, and I also have a few photos to show you as well. Can you guys see the pictures? Okay, so um, Chris is gonna go through the pictures, but this is the first time we've received pictures that you can actually see what the space is going to look like. They started painting and you can actually see the tile work in the bathrooms. That just blew me away because the last set of pictures just had everything ripped out. So um, it's, it's starting to take shape right now. The construction is on schedule and it's still within budget. Um, Derek has been meeting with Oliveri and HBM. They have bi-weekly construction meetings. And um, there is one issue that um, we're monitoring. There have been price hikes and some supply chain issues with materials stemming from the pandemic and the, the cold snap in Texas that have created some construction challenges nationwide. Um, but at this time, um, the issues have not caused any delays or budget ramifications for this project. So everything is moving forward at a good pace and, and on budget. So we'll continue to share pictures from the project so that you can see how it's, it's coming along, but it, it, it's, it's really starting to take off now. And that's it. It's looking good. Anything else for building and grounds committee? No. All right, thank you. Chris, finance and audit committee? Um, we did not have a meeting, um, but we did skip over my report earlier in the, the meeting. So if you don't mind, I'll just, it's very short. So I, I didn't want to follow Joe, so I didn't say anything, but <laughs> I figure I can I can go now. Um, did I miss you, Chris? I apologize. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, no, it's fine. Um, I really didn't have much to share anyways, um, which is usually a good thing. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to share a couple things. Um, so, so through the end of March, uh, we had uh, received about $5.3 million in revenue. Um, the same time last year, uh, we were at $3.9 million. Um, really, the only the, the two differences there were just uh, the collection timing from the levy. And then uh, so that, that'll eventually even up. And then the PLF is actually tracking a little bit higher this year than it was last year. Um, and then we have spent about $3 million this year, and we spent about 3.4 last year through March. So uh, really, we're, we're tracking about the same um, as we were last year. I imagine that'll uh, change pretty drastically, at least on the expense side, starting next month. Um, but we're, we're in line with where we uh, expect to be. Um, from a PLF perspective, um, we actually just received our PLF payment for April. So through April, um, we are up 9% compared to what we had budgeted. Um, or what the state had budgeted for us, uh, which is about $200,000. It will continue to be above uh, throughout the whole year. Some of that's going to depend on what the state ultimately decides uh, when they set the budget. Uh, I do think next month there's a, a fairly high likelihood that we might come in a little bit under. Um, and that's not because of any issues other than just the timing of tax collections. So with, uh, if you recall last year, um, May was a little bit of a low month because tax collections got uh, delayed by the IRS and the state. And then in August, we saw a large pickup because everything was delayed by 90 days. Um, there's a little bit, of, there was a, another, you know, extension this year. Um, so I expect that May, which is normally our largest month, uh, might not be the largest month. Uh, well, it just depends on, you know, how taxes are filed and collected. Um, I, I don't, I think that money will eventually come back to us, but I just, I suspect it might be lower in May. Uh, the normal, but again, we're up nine percent, um, so we're we're sitting very well revenue-wise. Uh, total for the year, we've spent about twenty percent of our budget through the first three months, um, so we're we're in pretty good shape. That's my report. All right, thank you, Chris. Any uh, any questions for Chris? Chris, again, my apologies. I was just so excited to get the Joe. I just you know went you know kind of missed you there. Human resources, any updates? Sorry, I'm muted. No updates from human resources. Okay, all right. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Um, any new business to come before the board this afternoon? 
believe so. No new business? No. Well, with that, then I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 Motion, motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and try to stay warm tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.